Now let's try to look and see how it has learned this problem. This is really the key question. Has it used this strategy that we've identified, this hierarchical strategy, to solve the object recognition problem? We can, first of all, look at the synaptic weights in the network. And here you can see a very important feature of this model, which is that we've used topographic patterns of connectivity. And so we always use this word topographic. It just means kind of organized according to the spatial layout of the neurons in the network, a topography like a spatial map. Um, and here what we've done is we've said that an individual neuron here is going to receive from a collection of four by four contiguous pools of neurons down here in V1. And you can kind of see here these kind of thick, slightly uh, wider seg segments between these groups of neurons. Those are what we call pools. Um, each pool down in V1 represents one spatial location with a full set of oriented edge detectors. Those uh, x-axis here is the orientation and the y-axis within each pool is representing the different types of features that are being coded, the different polarities and the end stopping, etc. And so this is basically saying that this neuron here is receiving from a contiguous topographically organized region of those uh, features. And as we go across, you can see we have this principle of half overlap. So as uh, we move across to a different neighboring pool in the V4 layer, we receive from a kind of half overlapping set of four by four pools in V1. And likewise, the V1, the V4 uh, layer has half the number of pools that v, V1 does. And so the, this simple kind of strategy of kind of reducing the size of the layers in half and using these half overlapping receptive fields along with again our wraparound uh, connectivity to avoid edge effects generally works very well. So that topography encourages this kind of overall solution as you can see but it, do it certainly doesn't guarantee it. Uh, the random network without any learning doesn't learn it and if you try to do this with heavy and learning it also doesn't learn it. So you need this error-driven learning, but the, the basic connectivity certainly is designed to help and support the overall solution that we see here. As we go up into IT, again, in this simple model, it's just one step um, already in infratemporal cortex. It's receiving from all of the V4 neurons. Um, and so there isn't any kind of additional levels of hierarchy needed here. Uh, but in our larger models, we do have multiple layers with those kind of neighborhood topographic representations. V4 also receives top-down from IT. Output receives from IT as well. And for any given object, as we're recognizing here in the output layer, each one of these neurons is a different object, it's receiving from multiple different IT units. And this tells us that we have a distributed representation of these object features in IT cortex. But it's a little bit hard to tell what those are. If we just click on these synaptic weights and we look at these patterns of connectivity, it's very hard to trace back and say, well, what is that particular neuron recognizing in the input? Um, so because of that difficulty, we have developed a technique here that we use in the model um, that's similar to one that's used in actual studies in the brain. Um, similar to a reverse correlation or a spike triggered averaging technique uh, that we call the activation based receptive field. And essentially what this does is it records the pattern of activity present when a individual neuron is active. And so it actually does a weighted average. So depending on how active that neuron is from a value of zero to one, um, we weight the corresponding pattern of activity in each of these different layers and also critically in the input image that we're looking at here um, as a function of the activity of each individual neuron. And that allows us to essentially reconstruct what patterns in general tended to be present when these neurons were active. And it sort of filters out all the other patterns when they weren't active because those all get zeros we just ran a test of the network presenting lots of different randomly generated versions of those input patterns. 
critically also including the two that we never trained the network on and you can see that those two have 100% error because it doesn't know what to call them uh, but what we're particularly interested in and looking at first here is these activation based receptive fields to understand what the individual neurons are coding okay, so these are the V4 neurons um, and so they are like that first level in the hierarchy that we were talking about they should be representing uh, small order, low order combinations of oriented features, right? So just a few horizontal and vertical lines, just like in that diagram. I mean, you really do see certain neurons that are very much just these kind of T, L uh, kind of uh, simple combinations of, of multiple line detectors. This kind of blurriness reflects the situation where this same neuron is responding to those set of features in all of a, a set of different contiguous locations. And that ends up looking like a blur because it's kind of weighting in this weighted average, each of those locations relatively equally. And so it just looks like a kind of blurry motion thing there. Um, that is the evidence of spatial invariance being rep uh, generated by these neurons. So they're responding to these features across a range of different locations. Here's a really nice simple one where you can see it's representing a T and you can see it's a blurry T. It represents that T across a, a smaller range of features. Some of these have much more kind of wide ranging spatial invariance where they respond to features across more locations. So again, this really corresponds to this idea that these first layer of neurons are encoding multiple line segments over a, a kind of smaller range of different spatial locations, just as we expect according to this theory. This model is developing these representations on the basis of this backpropagated error signal. And again, that shows us how important that backpropagation is in shaping features that are going to end up solving the overall problem. We can also look at the output uh, activation-based receptive field for these neurons. This is much smaller because there's many fewer neurons in the output layer. Um, and you can see critically that each individual V4 neuron is active for multiple different output layer objects, essentially. So again, we can see these kind of pools, these uh, wider lines, and then within there, that's one individual output layer. And you can see that there's always at least a couple and often many uh, <clears throat> output neurons active and what that means according to the logic of the activation based receptive field is that this v4 neuron was active at the same time as uh, a number of those different objects were active and that tells us that this v4 neuron these v4 neurons are in, are important for encoding across a range of different objects and that again makes sense because the features they're, they're encoding subparts or features of the overall objects that are being recognized. They're not, rec they're not coding for entire objects. Now, when we move up now to the IT level coding, this is going up to the, to the layer right before the output, we see a progression, again, just as we would expect according to that figure, of neurons that have a much wider range of spatial invariance and therefore are much blurrier um, and so you see this kind of very large range of kind of blurry responses um, here's a particularly dramatic one where it's responding to a lot of different uh, patterns over that kind of central region and it's hard to tell but because of the blurriness but it may be the case that they're more featurely complex um, you don't see evidence as much of kind of a single kind of vertical line or horizontal line that may suggest that it's responding to multiple combinations of those horizontal and vertical lines. The most informative information is actually looking at their relationship to the output neurons. And so this is showing us how active each output neuron was in conjunction with each individual IT neuron. And so each one of these pools is a different IT neuron and within that we're looking at the, the output coding and you can see here that this this particular IT neuron responded uh, was active when there were three different objects. Uh, here's one that is more or less focused for one particular object but there is a little bit of activity for some of these other objects. Here's one that's just two. So in general it's 
mostly a distributed representation, but it also is the case that these are fewer neurons act, fewer output units active and more kind of discreetly activated than what you see in V4. So V4 has a much more graded, coarse coded, distributed encoding of these object features and things are getting a lot crisper and more kind of discrete and coded for particular objects, subsets of objects when you get up into IT cortex. So again, this solution seems to work. We can understand this kind of conceptually and it is what the error-driven learning solution comes up with. And so that's a really nice uh, consistent understanding of how object recognition can be solved in the brain.